What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Liam Picks Fights. Today on the show, we're going to be breaking down my betting action for tomorrow night's UFC Vegas 22, headlined by Kevin Holland versus Derek Brunson in the middleweight division. Guys, Kevin Holland, big mouth. He's been trailblazing, if you will, his way through this middleweight division. Five wins in 2020. That's a big fight against Derek Brunson. He's been on an upward trajectory. He has a couple wins in a row now, three wins over relevant uh, UFC fighters. Uh, Elias Theodoro, he's been kicked to the curb, but he's still 18-3, and three, so a, a good professional record there. And then he also has wins over Ian Heinish and Edmund Shabazian in his last two. This is a big fight. It's going to have big stakes in the middleweight division. Could see a potential title challenger emerge if Kevin Holland is able to get the victory in this contest. So, guys, I'm going to be breaking down my action on that fight and some of the other fights on this card. But first, I want to just ask you three small favors before we get started today. If you guys could help me out, I'd really appreciate it. The first, thumbs up on this video. Guys, if you like these videos, I've been putting a lot of time, effort, and energy into the research that goes into them, as well as the production elements. We got a bunch of people involved in this show. So, Thank you guys for all your support. If you could, please like this video as we're getting started here. Also, get subscribed to Delphi Sports. This is the home of Liam Picks Fights. This is the home of informed risk-taking. Guys, these are two great shows. A lot of content being offered, and I think it's high quality in both directions. On the one front, Liam Picks Fights every Friday at 6 p.m. We're going to be breaking down betting action in the UFC, combat sports like you've come to expect. That's always going to be on Delphi Sports moving forward. Guys, in addition, informed risk-taking, we're going broader. We're talking about the whole world of sports gambling. We have informed risk-takers across the spectrum that have sharp insights, and it'll help you take a better informed risk. Whether you follow our picks or fade our picks, we think that we have good analytics and research that goes into what we talk about, and we hope that you guys will find value from that. So that is the second favor I had. The third favor, guys, get involved in the conversation on this show. If you could, drop a comment below. Let me know what's your favorite fight on this card. Or if not that, what's your favorite action that you're taking on this card? What do you like? What's the line that I'm missing? What haven't I talked about on this show that you think is an important piece of betting advice? Drop it below in the comments section. I'd really appreciate it. But getting right into it, guys, we're going to start with the main event. That's how we always get started on this show. Jump into the main event breakdown. And this week, I have action on the main event. I'm happy to report. And I'm going to go against the public a little bit. I'm going to go against some of the sharps here. I think that the Sharps are split on this fight uh, for good reason. I think that if you're backing Kevin Holland in this spot, guys, you're looking at the fact that this guy is very active. He had five fights in 2020, one all five. He's been beating guys uh, that are pretty relevant, I'd say. Uh, Jack Ray Souza, obviously, on the end of his uh, relevancy, but he had been fighting Jan Blachowicz one fight prior, uh, You know, the current UFC light heavyweight champion. So Jack Ray is looking to take on legitimate challenges. And Kevin Holland was able to knock him out in the very first round. That was an impressive win. That's what he's coming off of. And guys, I'm happy to report that I was one of the backers of Kevin Holland in that spot. I had 1.45 units on Kevin Holland at plus 100 uh, against Jacare Souza. I think he might have ended up uh, closing as the betting favorite there, but I got him at, a, at just even money odds. And I was very happy to get that price on Kevin Holland in that spot. There was a bigger age disparity in that fight than there is in this fight. Though there is still a disparity in age, Derek Brunson's the older guy here. He's going to come in 37 years of age. On the other side, you got uh, 29-year-old Kevin Holland. This is a good fight, or excuse me, maybe 28. Kevin Holland's a young man, but he's very experienced. They have a similar professional record, both with 21 wins coming into this contest. And I think that this is a fight that's going to probably end inside the distance uh, more often than not. I think that when you see some of the red flags on the Kevin Holland side. For example, Darren Stewart uh, almost getting a 10-8 round in the third round against Kevin Holland, in part because Kevin Holland appeared to be uh, gassed out, and in part because Darren Stewart was able to, to land three takedowns in that fight, was able to secure top position and, and rain down really hard ground and pound from the top position. Kevin Holland, after that fight, wasn't sure that he won, had a conversation with Dana, said, maybe I need to run that one back. And Darren Stewart hasn't had a ton of success in the UFC since. I mean, he was almost knocked out in the first round by Eric Anders his last time out. He looked very questionable against Maki Patolo before getting a submission win there. And we've seen other guys able to get that same kind of submission win over Maki Patolo. So I'm not sure how much it says about, um, you know, what Kevin Holland has to offer should this fight get extended. 
Derek Brunson doesn't have elite level cardio, but I thought that he showed better patience, composure, and shot selection in some of his more recent fights. And I think that what he's doing very well coming into this contest is he's mixing up his wrestling with his striking and leaving guys confused. There's been a few times where I really like to see Derek Brunson will reach, he'll grab an underhook, and then he'll let it go right away as they start to pummel and throw a big shot at your head. What Derek Brunson remembers out there these days is that it's a fight, and so he needs to be doing damage, but he also needs to be pushing his advantages. And I think he has a huge wrestling advantage in this fight. Granted, Kevin Holland's a black belt under Travis Luter. That's a, a high credential in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But guys, pump the brakes just a bit. Everybody's got to remember it was only 2019, right? His last loss against Brendan Allen, a guy who's fallen on some hard times of his own in the UFC, getting knocked out pretty viciously by Sean Strickland his last time out. You know, Brendan Allen was able to smother and take advantage of Kevin Holland for large portions of that fight. And when he was on top, he was able to do some damage. He was able to pass. He was able to get some good positions. And ultimately, he was able to get the back and, and finish the fight. And I, I heard Kevin Holland saying in the lead up to this fight, you know, Derek, Derek can't submit me. And, and he knows that he can't submit me. I don't know about that. You know, I, I have a small ticket, very small prop on Derek Brunson by submission at plus 1,400. Guys, Derek Brunson is very good at getting to the back, uh, the rear standing waist cinch. He can lift people up from there, big mat returns. Derek Brunson's a hell of a wrestler, D2 All-American and national champion, coached by Jamie Gibbs. I got a lot of respect uh, for his coaching and what he has to offer in the mental aspect of the sport. I think Derek Brunson has matured. I think that he has gotten a more patient approach. I think that he finally has the right coaching staff around him to maximize some of his tools and gifts. I've been really impressed by the career resurgence of Derek Brunson. And so I think that this fight breaks down two ways. I have small props littered across the board here. I have 0.2 units on Kevin Holland uh, to win in the very first round by knockout at plus 550. Derek Brunson, when he does lose a fight, guys, he tends to lose the fight by knockout in the first round more often than not. Granted, what people aren't talking about when they're talking about Derek Brunson's chin issue is the fact that those issues have appeared against Robert Whitaker, world champion, when admittedly Derek was rushing in, but landed a bunch of big shots, kind of had Robert Whitaker hurt and staggered in that fight. But I just think he got a little overzealous and he got out over his skis. The Israel Adesanya fight. This is a world champion who has 15 knockouts in mixed martial arts. I don't want to hear it that, that Derek Brunson has chin issues because he got finished by that guy. Uh, in addition, right, Derek Brunson, he got finished twice by Jacare Souza in the first round. Jacare Souza has eight knockout wins, right? He's got a bunch of finishes. He's a, a former world champion in other organizations. So the quality and caliber of guy that Derek Brunson was losing to, granted, I know that we're talking about Kevin Holland coming off a win over Jacare. That's Jacare at 41. We're talking about Kevin Holland, who, who his first knockout loss to Jacare was in 2012. OK, so I think a lot of the talk about uh, Derek Brunson's chin issues are a bit overstated. However, where does Kevin Holland win this fight? I mean, it's obvious if he's able to stay upright, if he's able to put pressure on Derek Brunson early. I think one of the things that's underrated about Kevin Holland is his psychological warfare. He's constantly giving guys something else to think about during the fight. Uh, I've seen really impressive results from Kevin Holland talking to a guy and getting him relaxed, getting him to think we're pals, getting him to think we're buddy-buddy, and then knocking them out cold viciously. And I think that he's a master psychological warfare. However, I think Derek Brunson, he's a grown man. I think that he's a little past some of that, uh, the talking and the, uh, the you know, pre-fight anxiety. Granted, it's still a fight. I know that Derek Brunson is going to have nerves like any other fighter, but I really feel like he's at a different point in his career. He's confident in his coaching and his preparation. And I think that Derek Brunson has an opportunity to come out here and get a lot of takedowns. Uh, if he's not able to, he's going to get starched on the feet early, guys. That's the prediction. I've got uh, a hedge bet, basically, to cover my ass, which is 0.2 units on Kevin Holland knockout round one and 0.2 units on Kevin Holland knockout round two. That is at plus 550 and plus 1,000, respectively. So that's the cover my ass bet. The real bet for me, I got one unit on Derek Brunson at plus 150. I believe in Derek Brunson in this spot. I think that he has, again, the ability to get takedowns here. We've seen Kevin Holland taken down in the first 30 seconds of four of his UFC fights, if I'm not mistaken. 
And he's given up his back to numerous competitors. I think that he puts himself in a lot of dangerous positions on the ground. I think he's a little overconfident sometimes on the ground. And I think that his cardio and his pace might be worn on by Derek Brunson getting to top positions, punishing him with shots to the body and shots to the head from the ground. And I think he might put a little doubt in Kevin Holland's mind. I don't think he's going to play into the talking in the games, but I have Derek Brunson inside the distance. That's how I see it going. I think that Derek Brunson cracks. When Derek Brunson wins, he finishes. And he put a hurting, a bad one on Edmund Shabazi and haven't seen him since. Uh, I think that Derek Brunson's ability to hurt people is underrated. He's, he knocked out Uriah Hall in the first round, I believe. This is a guy that has a bunch of UFC credible knockouts, and he's being undervalued in this spot. I got 0.75 units on Derek Brunson inside the distance at plus 310. And in addition, like I said, I got that 0.1 unit stab on Derek Brunson by submission. I just think he's going to spend so much time in the top position, potentially getting the back of Kevin Holland, which I've seen Kevin Holland give his back on numerous occasions. I don't see why Derek Brunson can't submit him if he gets in that position. Derek Brunson also has a submission at the UFC level. So I, it's not out of the realm of possibility. I think he's going to have a lot of top time. I think he's going to spend a lot of time on the back and in turtle. And if he can't finish the very tough and durable Kevin Holland with strikes, maybe he just hops on his back, takes the easy choke. I think that Derek Brunson is my personal side in this fight. I believe in him. If this line continues to float in this direction, I might add a little bit of exposure more on this fight. I think my total exposure uh, is a little over two units here. So I've got some expectations about this fight, but I think that I have a pretty decent read. I also, like I said, guys, I like this fight to not go to decision either way. Uh, so if you don't want to back a side in this fight, that's probably the way to go because I see uh, Derek Brunson either getting knocked out or finding a knockout or submission on Kevin Holland over the course of this fight. I think that one of them is going to suffer from a cardio dump at some point. Uh, given the pace of this fight, should uh, you know a finish not materialize early, I think the cardio will play a factor late. And I trust Derek Brunson, despite him being the older athlete here. I just have seen Kevin Holland uh, have more recent cardio issues in the UFC. I thought he was completely gassed against Aaron Stewart and on the verge of being finished there by a lower level fighter than Derek Brunson by a country mile. So I got Derek Brunson here. He might get knocked out early. I got the hedge play just in case, but I also think. Uh, that there might be value on the under two and a half. I just don't, I didn't want to play, or excuse me, not value. I think that the under two and a half might be the side, but I looked at the line and I didn't love uh, the price. So I'm going to take a pass on that. Moving right along, guys, we'll talk a little bit about the co-main event. The more I look into this fight, the more puzzled I am by it and, and the less uh, confident I am in a prediction either way. That's the honest truth. I think that on the one side, guys, we got Gregor Gillespie. He's coming off a KO loss to Kevin Lee. November 2019, that was at Madison Square Garden. It was a really devastating loss. I've said before, the kind of knockout that can change somebody's career. We haven't seen him since 2019. So that's an indication that he at least took some time, uh, tried to let his brain recover, refresh. I think that that's important. But he's coming back to the octagon now at 34 years of age after having lost his only real step up in competition in the UFC. I was saying on informed risk taking this week, I'm not really super impressed by the guys that Gregor Gillespie's beat. Granted, he beat them thoroughly. He beat them very convincingly. So he obviously has talent and skills and abilities. But I thought that he was able to be touched and, and hit a little bit when he was on the feet in those fights. Granted, it was a very short amount of time. Most of these guys are landing 10 or fewer strikes. But I thought the strikes they did land were pretty clean and impactful in some cases. And Gregor has shown a little bit of uh, wear on his face in some of his other fights. I don't think he's getting out of these fights unscathed. And granted, that's against a lower level opposition. I think Brad Riddell is better than a lot of the guys he's fought in the UFC. I think Gregor Gillespie's toughest or, or best win in the UFC, um, you know, it's arguable. Uh, Yancey Medeiros or Vince Bichel, I would say, are the two best names, uh, in my opinion. Glyco Franco was a pretty uh, decent win at the time, and he was an underdog in that fight. Uh, and he hasn't been one since. So, Gregor Gillespie, obviously a very talented guy. He opened minus 150 in this matchup, but the public's all over him, been bet to minus 250. Now we're at a 71% indication on the books. And I, I don't know that Gregor Gillespie wins this fight seven out of 10 times. Um, I think that Brad Riddell is a very tough guy to beat. I think that he's a dog. I think that he really wants to fight. 
Uh, I think that he's going to find small moments and opportunities uh, to land big strikes in this fight uh, and to create damage. It could be on elbows against the cage. It could be, uh, you know, a knee or an uppercut uh, in the clinch. But Brad Riddell really shines when he's throwing those straight punches. Um, and when he's throwing those kicks to the head, I think he's very dangerous with both of those techniques. He's also got, um, you know, an excellent calf kick. And we've seen Gregor kind of get kicked uh, across the calf a few times in the UFC as well. So I think that this matchup is going to play out way closer than the line indicates, but I also just don't know that I'm ready and willing to take the stab on Brad Riddell. The more I watch his UFC tape, guys, uh, the more questions are raised, in my opinion, about uh, his ability to win rounds. And what I mean by that is the guy has found a way to do it so far in the UFC despite himself. So he's been winning these fights and winning these rounds despite the fact he's getting taken down pretty routinely uh, and despite the fact that he's giving up a little bit of control time here in the clinch along the cage. So I think that in this spot, Gregor Gillespie needs to press Brad Riddell against the cage, hold him down, uh, and try and look for that submission. I think Gregor Gillespie, um, a submission is possible. I just don't know how likely it is. I think Brad Riddell is a really tough guy, and I don't think he's going to give anything up easy. But I, I'm also scared because Gregor Gillespie is an excellent wrestler. Like I said, I have some uh, love in my heart for Gregor Gillespie as a New York wrestler, representing on the big stage, showing the power of wrestling as a martial art. But I also think the Kevin Lee fight, go back and watch that one, guys. Kevin Lee gets in a very low stance, uncharacteristic of himself for that fight to prevent the takedowns. And Gregor knew that it would be harder to shoot. He was going to have to get a lower level. He was going to have to take a crappier shot from further away. And he might eat one of those uppercuts or straight punches on the way in. And uh, Kevin Lee was able to down block the only attempt that he did take in that fight. And when they were boxing, I just thought that Gillespie looked a little tentative. And he was getting moved around by some of the punches of Kevin Lee. He was landing his own shots. He looked good on the offense. I think that that's the problem for Gregor Gillespie in this fight, is that Gregor Gillespie looks very good on the offense. But I think Brad Riddell is going to get some offense in this fight. And I don't know how good at taking offense Gregor Gillespie is. Uh, I think that he trains at Belmore Kickboxing Academy. I've heard good things about some of his sparring partners, but I don't know. I, I feel like Brad Riddell does come from a great camp, excellent coaching. He's a very serious competitor. He's the younger guy by five years. I really like that. This is not a fight where Gregor's taking on a bigger, taller, longer uh, lightweight. He's taking on a shorter, compact, pretty strong uh, lightweight. Now, granted, I've also heard that people think Brad Riddell could make it down to 145 pounds. I mean, maybe that's true. Um, I don't know that Brad Riddell could do that. I think he's a pretty thick and, and strong and muscular dude. Uh, and I think that, especially for this fight, does he have any illusions about what the game plan is here? It's you got to stay on your feet. you got to maximize moments and opportunities on the feet. And you have to make sure that every time that he tries to advance on you, you punish it. And I think that, Brad Riddell has a better chance of doing that than a lot of Gregor Gillespie opponents have had in the UFC, but I also don't think I'm willing to take that stab until Brad gets over plus 250, uh, given some of the liabilities here. I just think that optically this is going to be a bad fight for Brad if it goes to the scorecards, but I do think that Brad could touch that chin and put him out. I think Brad Riddell is a very powerful guy. I think he's hurt guys in the UFC. I think he's due for a knockout one of these days in the UFC, but again, Having not seen it, having not uh, put it in evidence without a UFC finish, I'm not going to back Brad Riddell inside the distance here. Uh, I'm also going to stay away from that Brad Riddell money line unless it goes over plus 250. Then I'm going to start taking a look at that line again. So moving right along, guys, the low-key banger of the week. Alert, alert. Somebody tell the press is this is the one, guys. If you want to watch a fight from the prelims and get your entertainment value out of this card, I think that this is the one. Leo Santos, Grant Dawson. I've been talking about it all week. I've been fired up about it. And I just went absolutely outrageous with my props here. Uh, I think that we got some good opportunities to target props in this fight in particular because I think that there's clear um, stylistic uh, dimensions to this fight. I'll explain what I mean. Leo Santos on the one side, guys, he's 41 years of age. He's the older guy. 
But he's the longer guy. He's the taller guy. He's fighting Grant Dawson, the young kid, moving up to 155 from 145, having missed weight a few times. Grant Dawson looks like a serious talent. But Leo Santos on the other side, guys, he's a seven-time Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion. All right? He's undefeated in the UFC over eight years. Granted, he's only had seven UFC fights. Still, this is a guy who's very impressive. Uh, his losses are to the likes of Santiago Ponzinibbio, for example, uh, a long time ago on The Ultimate Fighter. That's not a bad loss. So Leo Santos has been very good at this fighting thing for a long time. And he had this habit of coming back to the UFC after a long layoff, destroying some young up-and-coming prospect, and going away again for another 18 months. But this time, guys, he's coming back after only eight months of layoff here to fight Grant Dawson. Grant Dawson's coming here. Uh, Glory MMA and Fitness, coached by James Krause. Everybody's very high on this team. Uh, I like James Krause. I think he's a smart guy. I think he's sharp. And I heard him talking about this fight. And he thinks that Grant Dawson's going to submit Leo Santos. I was surprised to hear him say that. Um, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility because I do believe Leo Santos is a dangerous and excellent fighter for about eight and a half minutes. I think after that point, especially given his age, he's going to have a hard time rallying uh, in that third round. He's going to have a hard time, um, you know, keeping keeping the uh, the wheels on the road. That's how I describe it. Santos looked a little sketchy in his last fight at the UFC against Roman Bogatov, who's since been cut for a bunch of uh, fouls and fractions in that fight in the third round. Illegal knees. Um, you know, th- that guy uh, also low blows, just terrible, terrible uh, fighter, Roman Bogatov. And glad to see him uh, dismissed from the UFC for that very strange and, uh, you know, incredibly illegal performance. But Leo Santos did show a lot of signs of wear in that fight. He was vi- visibly gassed. Although, again, his visible gassing came from the fact that he basically had um, his opponent finished on the feet, hit him with four clean right hands in a row, which is normally his kill shot. The guy did look out on his feet, and then he blasted him with a right head kick. And the guy just stuck around and somehow gutted his way through it. And I think that the referee did that guy no favors because I think he was – uh, he was out on his feet for a few of those shots. I thought that it could have been stopped. I think he kind of woke back up and just started fighting again. But Leo Santos is dangerous, guys. I have exposure on him in this fight. Uh, I have Leo Santos round one plus 600. Leo Santos round one KO plus 1,000. Leo Santos round one sub plus 1,400. And to cover my butt, I've got Leo Santos in round two plus 850 and Grant Dawson in round three plus 1,200. I think Leo Santos has a great opportunity to win this fight, to win it violently, and to win it early. I think Grant Dawson wants to close the distance, and is going to be forced to do so. And I think that he could eat one of those straight right hands as he's doing so, and the whole night could be over fast for Grant Dawson, especially moving up a weight, especially against the taller, longer striker, who, again, he's a seven-time Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion, and you never know it by the fact that he comes out here, he does not seek takedowns, he puts hard punches on your head, he puts hard cap kicks on your leg, and he can hit to the body too. This guy is uh, well versed. He's got hard body kicks. He's he's not afraid to throw them either. What are you going to do? Take him down? This guy is dangerous, man. Leo Santos. I don't care that he's forty one years of age. I'm telling you that Leo Santos has a lot of ways to win this fight because of his skills and his abilities. Again, Grant Dawson on the other side here. Grant Dawson in round three is live. Grant Dawson by decision is live. Um, you know, I just I don't want to pay minus 200 for Grant Dawson against a guy who I think has all the tools and abilities to beat him. But I do know that Grant Dawson is going to be the fresher fighter after three rounds. I know that Grant Dawson is going to be putting on a relentless will and pace. I know that he wants it real bad. He's a young up and coming prospect. He's 16 and one. He's a very tough kid. So I got a lot of good things to say about Grant Dawson. I got no problem with people that are backing him in this spot, especially if you're backing him in round three, especially if you're backing him, uh, you know, to win this fight late or to win it by decision. I think that that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to go the other way in terms of taking a little bit of exposure on these props. I think that Leo Santos has a lot of upside here. I don't care that he's 41 in the sense that I think he's the better striker. I think he's the better uh, grappler in this matchup. And that alone is enough for me to take those stabs on the round props. I've had a bunch of success with them this year. I've also missed on them before. So I'm willing to take a little bit of exposure here. I got about two units sprinkled across this fight. But here's the other thing that I like. 
The bite does not go the distance at plus 130. I thought that that had some upside to it as well. Like I said, Leo Santos doesn't have all the cardio to go. So I think that he could be finished in that third round. He's also a violent finisher. Grant Dawson's got some finishes in the UFC. I think both of these guys are live for a finish here. I prefer the Santos inside the distance than the Dawson inside the distance. But again, that's just me loving this guy, Leo Santos, uh, you know, the, the unicorn of the UFC who fights every couple of years, knocks out a big prospect. He's got a knockout win over Kevin Lee. He's got another big knockout win over Stevie Ray. This guy's dangerous, man. And I think people are sleeping on him because of his age. I think Leo Santos could make magic once again at UFC Vegas 22. And I'm hoping he does. If he's able to do it in that very first round, guys, it's going to be a big profit for me on that fight. I can tell you that. So moving right along, guys, the last thing I wanted to talk about just briefly today, I had a fight get canceled uh, today. Julia Avilo versus Julija Stolyarenko. This was a fight I was looking forward to. I thought that both women had some uh, talent and upside in this matchup. I preferred Avila. I preferred Avila, uh, Avila, excuse me, by KO at plus 275. Uh, I preferred the under and the fight does not go to decision for this fight at plus 160. I thought both of these women had paths to victory. Stoliarenko, basically an armbar reliant fighter for the most part, but also has some interesting striking uh, <laughs> when she's allowed to strike a space, but can easily be clinched up against the cage and has also been finished twice herself in professional MMA. And then on the other side, we have Julia Villa, who, or uh, Vila, who has incredible KO power uh, for a woman in uh, mixed martial arts. She has landed big, uh, powerful shots and rocked people in the UFC. And this is a woman that I want to be backing and targeting uh, moving forward. I just didn't want the money line price here. I thought that there was more upside that this fight does not go to the decision. Uh, and again, we we're getting plus 160 on that in a fight where I thought both women had a path to a finish victory. But what I really want to talk about here is that harrowing visual. This fight has been canceled because uh, Julia Stoliarenko fell off the scale, fainted while she was weighing in for this contest. Granted, I want to give her the credit that she made weight 135.5 pounds uh, under the contracted 136 pound limit. But it's just another painful reminder in this sport that these men and women are sacrificing their bodies in order to make these weight classes. They're doing extreme weight cuts, uh, many of them losing incredible amounts of weight in the lead up to this contest, trying to quickly put it all back on in time for the fight. I think it's one of the harder aspects of the sport to get behind. I'm a wrestler. I understand what weight cutting is, um, but I think it should be done in a healthy manner, in a sustainable manner. And I don't believe that massive drops in weight, uh, cutting 20, 30, 40 pounds as a grown adult, uh, is part of any healthy or sustainable weight management program. And I think that we have to be managing weight. We have to live a lifestyle that's healthy and uh, that allows us to be in our best competitive space. And I don't think that cutting 20 pounds uh, off your body necessarily allows you to do that. Uh, I think that it's a, it's a price that we're seeing a lot of people pay in this sport. And I, I don't think it helps our brains, uh, people that participate in combat sports, Cutting massive amounts of weight, uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't have a performance benefit a lot of the time. It has a performance detriment that I don't think enough people are cognizant of. Granted, is it fun to be the bigger, stronger athlete in a contest? Maybe, but that sounds like bullying to me. It doesn't sound like competitors who want to get out there and scrap and put it on the line against other people their size, their weight. Um, that's what we should be looking to do. We should be trying to find a way to have fighters fight at their natural weight class. It's, it's really scary to see somebody uh, fainting like that, could have hurt herself, um, you know, had to be hospitalized. After that, the fight is canceled. Now neither woman has an opportunity to compete. And, and for what benefit? Uh, I think that there's something that needs to be done. I'm not the man that says I have all the answers, but I just think another terrible example of the uh, negative consequences of weight cutting and mixed martial arts, and it was a really scary visual. We are uh, hoping and praying on this show for the health and safety of Julia Stoliarenko, first and foremost. But I also just think it's a reckoning for the sport, something that we have to take account of, that we have to take more seriously, and that we should try and find a way to address as a community moving forward. So don't want to end the show on a somber note, guys. I want to say war Derek Brunson. We got money on Derek Brunson on the money line. War Leo Santos. We're really hoping that he can come through for us early, but we're really hoping that that fight does not go the distance. That's our ultimate goal there. And that Grant Dawson, if he does get it done, he gets it done late. 
Uh, moving right along, if that Brad Riddell money line gets above plus 250, I might get involved. Otherwise, I'm going to sit back, watch, and be entertained by two excellent lightweights. I will post any additional plays that I have for you guys on Twitter. You can also check betmma.tips slash Liam Heslin, where you can find not only my picks, but oftentimes, guys, you can find a written breakdown, a rationale, explaining to you exactly why I'm taking the side that I'm taking. Uh, I also just have a flyer. This is a little bit degenerate of me, but I took it because I think that this guy has certainly a puncher's chance. Jesse Strader against Montel Jackson. Montel Jackson is every uh, bookmaker's favorite fighter. He's minus 800 in this fight. Granted, he's taking on a UFC newcomer who's fairly green. But guys, I went back. I watched these fights. I believe that Jesse Strader has uh, power in his hands. I think that he is a pretty ballsy fighter. I think he's going to put it on the line. I think that he's going to try and knock out Montel Jackson in the first round. Montel Jackson, big, long, tall. I think he could get hit with some of these shots in the body. Uh, he's got a nice, Jesse Strader does have a nice uh, combination where he'll throw a couple shots to the body, get you to react. Uh, sometimes he throws two, sometimes he throws three or four. So he mixes up the rhythm on these, and then he starts throwing those same hooks upstairs as you go to bring the elbows down. And he has knocked guys out on the regional scene doing this. Not saying it's a, a sure thing. Not saying I'm very confident in Jesse Strader here. I wouldn't make him the favorite, but I think Montel Jackson coming off a loss as a minus, eight, uh, minus 800 favorite in this spot is a little absurd. So I'm going to take a small stab, Jesse Strader plus 500. I think the market uh, has already contracted just a bit to plus 500 or so for Jesse Strader. I got that one uh, you know, pretty early on, but I wanted to wait and see how the line moved. So I'm comfortable telling you guys, that's my action so far. That's what I'm taking my plays on. That's where I think I have a chance of making money and turning profit on this event. I'm hopeful that I'm able to do so. I'm hopeful that you're able to do so, whether you follow my action or whether you fade my action. And guys, whichever action you're taking, like I said, let me know in the comment section below. I'd love to talk more about uh, this with you because this is what I love. This is what I live. This is what I breathe. Uh, I spend a lot of time, effort, and energy. I got over 25 pages of notes on these fighters, these fights for this weekend because I was really fired up about this card and about coming back strong after a tough weekend last weekend. So Derek Brunson, Kevin Holland, that's the main event. It should be a banger. It's a middleweight fight. We also got the bangers that I told you about from the prelim and uh, as well as that co-main event that I'm going to sit back, watch, and enjoy that lightweight scrap between Gregor Gillespie and Brad Riddell. I think it's a great night of fights. I hope that you guys enjoy. God bless you all. Enjoy the fights. Thank you for watching another great episode. Please like and subscribe. Tell a friend about the show. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again next Friday. We'll have all the same fun then.